I'm going to tell you how to compute the surface area of a surface of revolution, but first I'm going to tell you what a surface of revolution actually is. So to explain that I'm going to take an interval uh, from A to B, actually let's just for simplicity say from 0 to 1, uh, and a function over that interval, we call it f, um, and I'm going to assume the function is continuously differentiable, otherwise known as c1. So it's a c1 function. And so take the graph of that function inside the plane, embed the plane into three-dimensional space. Here I'm drawing it as the xz plane. Uh, so there's the graph sitting inside the plane and rotate it around the x-axis all the way around until it comes back to itself and it will trace out a surface which in this case looks like the side of a vase. Not the bottom but the side of a vase. Okay so what is what's the formula I'm going to prove for the surface area? Uh, let's give it a name say S it's not a 5, it's an S. The area of S equals 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 1 or A to B um, of the function F times the square root of 1 plus F dot squared. So that's the derivative with respect to T squared dt. Okay, so some integral. How are we going to prove this? Well, first we need to really define what we mean by the area of S. And the way we define areas is by approximation. So what we're going to do is split this interval into n pieces. So each piece uh, has width epsilon, which is 1 over m. And let's let's label them. So uh, these points I've drawn I'm going to call T0, T1, all the way up to Tn. So T0 equals 0, Tn equals 1, and I guess Tk equals k over n. So, so here's TK, this point here. Okay, so we've split up the interval into lots of pieces. We're going to approximate the function by drawing tangent lines. So let's at T0, let's draw the tangent line there. At T1, let's draw the tangent line there. At T2, sorry, these are not looking like tangent lines, but they're supposed to. So the point is this is a slope at this point ti, t, tk, um, whose, whose slope is equal to the derivative at that point. So what we then do is we rotate these lines in the same way we rotated the graph and we obtain something that looks like this. So it's like a truncated cone, otherwise known as a frustum, which is the subject of an earlier video. Um, we obtain a sequence of these frusta approximating our surface. And what we will do is define the area of the surface to be the limit as our interval gets split up into more and more pieces, so the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum um, from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of the areas of these frusta fk. So this is f0, f1, and we'll keep approximating by more and more of these fk. Okay, um, I'm now going to recall a formula for the area of a frustum that I proved in an earlier video. So here it is. Uh, let's put it down here. 
So if the frustum connects a circle of radius q and a circle of radius r, and the distance along the surface of the frustum between those two circles is d, then the area is given by this formula, pi times d times q plus r. Um, so we're going to have lots and lots of frusta. Um, so given the frustum fk, let me draw a picture of it just from side on, it'll look like this. So here we have radius qk, here we have radius rk, the distance between these is epsilon, which is remember 1 over n, um, and this distance here I will call dk, because they all depend on k. So what's the surface area of this? Well, in order to express, uh, we know that we know the formula for the surface area is is this pi d q plus r. We need to work out what q, k, r, k, and d k are in terms of things we know. Well, just looking at this frustum from side on, we can see that the height q k is precisely the value of the function f at, at t k. So q k equals f at tk because this is just the point on the graph at, over, over tk so this is tk and we move along the line the straight line with the slope f dot at tk and we we move that far we move epsilon along that line so that means that this difference between these two heights here is f dot at tk times epsilon. So rk equals qk plus f dot tk times epsilon. And we can work out dk by Pythagoras' theorem, right, because it's a right angle triangle here. Um, so we get square root of, well the base is epsilon, so we get epsilon squared plus the height, which is epsilon times f dot. So we get epsilon squared times f dot squared, tk, all square rooted. And that's our dk. Right, so the area of the frustum fk is pi times d, well, let's take this factor of epsilon out right so we, there's an epsilon squared take it out take it outside the square root and it just becomes an epsilon left with one plus f dot of tk squared square rooted and then we have qk plus rk so this is times f at tk plus f at tk so two of these plus epsilon times f dot at tk. Okay, good. Now, the area of S, the whole surface, is the limit, this then goes to infinity, of the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1, of these areas. So let's write them out now. So we get pi times epsilon times 1 plus f dot squared at tk. Uh, sorry, the squared should probably go here. Um, then times this 2f at tk. And then we're going to multiply out these brackets. So let's, let's write another term plus the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of pi times epsilon times epsilon, so epsilon squared, times f dot tk, and then with this square root still, 1 plus f dot tk squared. So the great thing about this second term, although it looks more complicated maybe, is that we can ignore it because of this epsilon squared. So remember, I was assuming f was a continuously differentiable or c1 function. 
and we can now use that to great effect. That's supposed to be an exclamation mark. Um, because I can, that, that means the derivative f dot is continuous, uh, which means we have a continuous function f dot on a closed bounded interval from 0 to 1. So f dot is bounded. So a continuous bounded function. Apologies for the abbreviations, this is what I always write. Continuous bounded function f dot implies that this is bounded, this is bounded, so this whole thing is bounded by some constant c. Bounded both from above and from below, so in magnitude it's bounded. That means this whole second term is less than or equal to, well, some from 0 to n minus 1 of pi. Epsilon is 1 over n, so we get a 1 over n squared times a constant. Now summing from 0 to n minus 1 is the same as multiplying by n because we're just adding the same thing up. So this n squared and this n cancel. And we have 1 over n, and as we take the limit, this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So we can ignore this whole messy, yucky term. Now what's left? is actually something we should recognize. So this equals, well, there's 2 pi. Here's the pi, here's the 2. And then there's epsilon times some expression, some expression. This is just what we would get if we wrote out the following integral. Right, this is a Riemann integral. We do it by approximating the in integral interval where integrating over um, by n equal pieces. We get a sum where we take the limit of that to define this integral. And this is exactly what we would get if we wrote out the definition of the Riemann integral for this particular integral. Right, but this is exactly the expression I wanted to start off with. 